Hey, everyone. Welcome back to another Thursday at Home with Olympus. Uh, today, we're changing gears a little bit from Astro April and partially Astro May, and we are going to move into backyard birding. Uh, it's spring. There's lots of little baby birds out and about, and uh, we're going to invite Olympus educator Steve Ball on tonight. Before I do that, I want to do a couple quick housekeeping things. As always, if you were late to this viewing, don't worry, it's being recorded. You can watch it on the replay right at the end of this session on both our Facebook page and our YouTube page. Um, and we're going to also save our questions for the end again tonight, like we normally do. And we will have a Q&A session at the end of our presentation. Hmm, I guess that's all the housekeeping. Yeah, we'll bring Steve on and, and, and say good evening to Steve Ball. Hey, Steve. Hey, how you doing, Michelle? Hello, Not too shabby. <laughs> I was so excited for this. I was out in my backyard all night last night taking pictures of the birds. And now I'm like, Steve's going to tell me how to get better at this. So, uh -oh. <laughs> Well, I'll kind of walk you through a lot of the different things that I've tried over the last couple of years. And particularly over this last year where we've spent a lot of time at home in our backyards. Um, some of the things that worked, some that didn't, you know, some different things to try. So um, the goal is to just help everybody, give them a couple ideas and see if we can't uh, help improve their backyard bird photography. Awesome. All right. Well, if you want to load up your slideshow for me, I will get out of your hair and let you do your thing. We're ready to go. You we'll are. All learn. All right. Okay. Let's you see. can see That's that full good. screen. We're we're good. Yep. We can see your slides, and I will let you guys all learn from Steve. Thanks for joining us tonight. Okay. Well, again, uh, thanks everybody for joining in. Coming to you from outside of Seattle, um, so up in the Pacific Northwest, and you know, beautiful spring day today. Uh, and again, so our goal today, you know, I, I'd love for you all to get better at your backyard bird photography. You know, whether that means attracting a few more birds, or you know, just how to set things up so that you can get some nicer looking pictures. Um, that's really the goal. We've got a lot of feeders in our backyard, but my, my goal is always to try to take a picture that looks more natural. You know, I try to keep the bird feeders out of it, try to keep the next door neighbor's houses out of my pictures, and, and we'll kind of walk through a lot of the different steps as to how to go about that. Um, and one of the main things was really to, to get you thinking as to how your camera actually sees what you're looking at, how different focal lengths will affect the different looks of your images, there's a lot of times, if you do spend a lot of time in your backyard with the birds, where you can physically get pretty close if you want, but, you know, maybe some of the reasons why you do want to stay back a little bit farther and use a little more telephoto than, um, than getting up nice and close. So some of the keys, you know, um, what we're looking for when we talk about getting a good image of a bird, close as eye always has to be in focus. You always want your exposures to be just, you know, absolutely right on the money. You don't want to lose any of the detail in some of the lighter color feathers or portions of your image. You want a real nice composition. You know, I try to use the rule of thirds as much as possible. But the goal, particularly in backyards where it gets challenging, is getting a nice clean background. You know, you really want that bird to stand out in your image. If you can get them into a nice pose where you can see, you know, the full bird get some of the feather detail in the tail as well as the head. That's always a great thing. And again, just get that natural setting, even though it may be between your barbecue pit and, you know, the hammock in the backyard, you want it to look as natural as possible. Hey, that's all it takes, you know. <laughs> and how do you get there? You know, those are really the steps. What you, what you really need, if you want birds to be coming into your yard and you want them to be comfortable, you want them to stay, you want them to come back on a regular basis, it's food, water, and shelter. If you have those things, you will have birds. Now, it may not be all the birds you want, maybe not the specific species, but you will get birds in your yard if you provide food, water, and shelter. Um, that's what they depend on. So we're a little bit crazy at our house. In our backyard, I've got four hummingbird feeders. I've got four bird baths. I've got one tube feeder for birds, uh, one platform feeder, a couple suet feeders, and we also just put some food on the ground. We get a lot of, in this area, ground feeding birds where they're just as happy eating out of the grass as they are anything else. So, you know, again, how do we arrange those to get the best pictures? We'll kind of go into that. 
a lot of it though when it comes to taking pictures is not necessarily Oh, how do I want to say it? it? It's where do you want the birds to be? Not necessarily what's the easiest place to put a bird feeder, but where's the place that you want to put your feeder or you want to put the perches for the birds to land on that's going to give you the best results. So you kind of have to take a, a good look at your backyard throughout the day. Where is the light going to be the best? You know, do you have some areas that have a better background than others so that if you're you know, again, you, you want to put your feeder up and you want to take pictures of the birds on the feeder. Are you going to have a tree in the background or are you going to have your next door neighbor's car in the background? You know, you want to be able to look and try to place things accordingly. Also real important, where do you want to shoot from? I've got it set up in my backyard where I've got three different spots where I can take pictures. One spot in the morning, one in the afternoon, and then one where I'm just shooting out my back door uh, where I can kind of shoot throughout the day, depending on, on the look that I'm going after. Um, what type of birds are coming to your feeders will depend on the kind of food you put out, but also maybe how you arrange things can be affected a little bit. Um, you know, things to consider, how much depth of field, you know, uh, do you have that fence real close by the feeder or do you have a little bit of room to play with? Now we've got a fairly small backyard, which I think is the, next picture to kind of show you what we're working with. But also again, as you're watching the sun throughout the day, what are the best times to shoot? Now you tend to get more bird activity in the mornings and the evenings. I know for me this time of year, between about seven o'clock in the morning and nine o'clock, I get a lot of bird activity, real good light. And that's those are great times to shoot. In the evenings, I've got between about five o'clock to seven o'clock are the best times. And during the day, I don't tend to shoot as much, or if I do, maybe I'll experiment using a flash or something, and I've, I've got some samples of kind of with and without that to show you what that looks like as we go. But it's a big numbers game. So with proper perch placement, and if you all say that three times real fast, uh, <laughs> that'll help. So the way I look at things, if I've got 30 birds that are kind of come into my yard, if I go outside for a half an hour, an hour to try to shoot, um, and I've got my bird feeder set up properly and I've got my perch next to my feeder and tend to want it a little bit higher than where the food is. So that if multiple birds come, they'll tend to line up on the perch and then take their turns going to the feeder. Uh, but if I've got 30 birds that come in, you're probably going to get at least 10, maybe half of the birds that are going to land on that perch before they go to the food. They like to fly into the yard and land and be able to look around a little bit first, see if there's any predators, see what other birds are gonna be in the area that might offer competition, but they're gonna to wanna to stop, look for a few seconds to see what else is around and then go directly to the food. So if you've got a perch placed properly, again, a little bit above and between where they tend to come from and your food source, you're gonna get a real high percentage of birds that are gonna land on that perch first. So again, if you've got 30 birds coming to your yard, you're gonna get five to 10 that are gonna land on that perch, give you an opportunity to get some shots. It's not gonna be every single time, uh, but you'll get a real high percentage as you go with that. So this is my backyard, not exactly a garden spot. Um, I, <laughs> and, and I get out of a lot of lawn care because I don't wanna put fertilizer down. We don't wanna, Harm the birds, at least that's the excuse that I use with my wife all the time. Uh, but you can see we've got our feeders and, our, and different things scattered throughout the yard. And this is always a work in progress. Things are, are moving around all the time. Um, but there's not, you know, that beautiful tree, that beautiful view. Uh, it's just whatever I do, I kind of have to craft and make something that'll get me a good image in the long run. So how do we do that? Number one is, you know, telephoto lens is going to be the, the lens that you're going to want to use. The longer the telephoto that you have, the easier it becomes. Now, you know, for two reasons. Number one, with the greater working distance, because you've got that higher magnification, you're farther away from the birds. So you're not going to inhibit them from their natural behaviors. You know, they're going to feel free to fly in. If I'm at the far side of my yard and I'm shooting something, uh, you know, where I have my perch set, they're not going to be bothered by me. I've got given them more than enough room, more than enough space. Uh, they're going to be comfortable and, and go through their natural um, routines. 
but also when you're using a longer lens, you're actually, because you're using that narrower field of view, you're going to eliminate a lot of the background automatically. It also is going to make it a little bit easier to throw that background out of focus. Now, you do want your subject to be as far away from the background as possible to do that. Uh, but our goal is to try to throw your background as out of focus as possible. Again, you want your subject to stand out. If you're shooting things that are going to be overhead, again, with a little longer lens, you're not directly underneath shooting straight up. You can be farther back. You're not shooting at such a steep angle. It just gives you a much nicer perspective. And the same as when you're, when you're shooting down a little bit. If you're sitting in a chair and you're shooting birds on the ground, if you're farther back, again, it gives you that, that little bit nicer perspective when you're shooting. So here's an example. This bird was very cooperative, sat on the table for me for a little bit, but it just shows you. Using a 420 millimeter focal length, this was the 300 millimeter f4 lens with the teleconverter, um, you can see on the left the perspective that you get. Yes, I could physically move closer in this case, just showing with a 100 millimeter focal length, but you can see the background, how it's a lot more distracting. You're getting more in the background because you are getting that wider field of view. Now they're both, you know, kind of equally out of focus, but it just, it's a much more pleasing background on the left, being a little farther back, using that telephoto, eliminating as much of the background clutter as possible. So that's going to be a big help. If you've got you know, say the 75 to 300 or the 100 to 400, you know, use it out towards that telephoto end as much as you possibly can. Now, you may only be able to back up so far when you're working in your backyard, but the longer the telephoto, generally the easier it is to control what you're seeing in the background. Something also very important when you're working in a, in a cluttered area is going to be your depth of field. So that's, for those not familiar, that's how much is going to be in focus from front to back in your image. Our goal, you know, when we're doing this type of thing, when you're trying to, you know, whether it's a portrait of a person or you're doing more portraits of birds, you want that creamy out of focus background that's not going to be a distraction. So you want to use the largest opening on your lens that you possibly can, the smallest F number. On the 300 millimeter lens, that's going to be f4. On the 75 to 300, that's I think it's 6.7 or so at the telephoto lens. And excuse me. Um, and the general rule of thumb again, you want that background as far away from your subject as possible to get a complete blur. You know, you want it to be probably twice as far away as your subject is in a, in a perfect world. Now we can't always get that, but that would be ideal. So an example, if, in my backyard, if I set my perch 12 feet away from where I'm shooting, if I can have my fence 24 feet beyond my subject, I'm pretty well guaranteed that it's going to be a, a complete blur and not going to be a distraction. So when you're thinking about where you're going to set up your feeders and your perches, you want to keep some of these things in mind. You know, keep it as far away from those, you know, from the garage or for whatever it might be in the background as possible so you can try to blur that out. Here's some just some different examples. Uh, this was a very cooperative bird just last night, as a matter of fact. This is a, a little baby dark-eyed junco coming to the yard for the first time by itself. Landed on a little perch that I had set up. Stayed long enough, I was able to shoot at some different um, apertures. So you can see, by using f6.3, uh, this was actually with the 150 to 400 millimeter lens with the teleconverter engaged which is how I got to F29, which is kind of a funny F number. But shooting it close to wide open, wide open would have been 5.6, stopped it down just a half stop. You can see how the background just kind of blurs and goes away, and the bird really stands out. Stopping the lens down a little bit. Uh, if it's a bigger bird, maybe you need to do that to keep the bird in focus. But in this case, small bird, um, you're starting to get a little bit of background detail, not too conf not too bad at this point but by stopping the lens down all the way you can see you're starting to get a lot more detail in the grass behind the bird and it just becomes a little bit distracting so you know again using the longest telephoto shooting wide open just trying to blur that background out as much as possible you know here's a case where this is a, a slatted wood fence in the background but it's just so out of focus that it looks pretty reasonable nah, not the greatest color background but not bad. 
Uh, same case here. You can see this is a slat. When you start to get light shining through the slat, it looks a little funny above the head there, but it's so out of focus that in this case, I think it works reasonably well. But let's get, you know, background setups. You know, how do we get pictures that look natural even when it's not? This is about as basic as it gets. We get a lot of birds that like to eat off the ground. So when we first started this, so oh gosh, two, three years ago now, we just started out feeding our birds by putting a plate out in the backyard and putting some feed on it. Birds, if you've been around them and fed them much, you know, they're slobs. They get in the tray and they start kicking food all over the place. But in order to get a picture, you know, again, ugly fence surrounding my yard. So literally just got a roll of duct tape, got some construction paper, basically. This is uh, roll paper that you can get at any camera store. Got something which I was hoping would look somewhat sky bluish, just taped it to the fence. I knew with my long telephoto and I was sitting with my back against my house shooting across the yard with the 300 millimeter lens, I was gonna get a small area. When you put a branch out for a perch above the food, the birds are gonna always wanna land on the high side of that perch. So if you angle it up, it's gonna kinda of narrow down where you need to be watching for the bird to land. Because when they land, it's only gonna be for a couple seconds and you've gotta be pretty quick. So by pre-focusing at the top of that perch, I know as soon as those birds hit, I'm ready to take a picture and, and can click off my images. So real cheesy, real ugly setup, but because I'm just taking a very narrow view, I'm able to get a very natural looking picture. So, you know, does it look like a perfect sky blue? Ah, close enough that it, it looks natural, even though this was done again, leaning against my house, shooting against the fence on the far side. Again, the birds are always going to land up towards the top of the perch, which makes it a little bit easier. The blue I thought looked good, but I figured I'd try some other colors. Meh, didn't work out so well. But, you know, again, you can experiment. You know, you can go out every day, try something a little bit different. Getting a, a little bit fancier, I set this up with, with two different things in mind. You know, as we were kind of evolving and changing things around, found some pieces of log down the street, brought it home. Again, my wife thinks I'm crazy for doing these a lot of times, but we just put food on top of that. Uh, I don't have any real shelter for birds in our yard. Fortunately, on the other side of the fence, our neighbor does, and the birds are in and out of that tree before they come eat quite a bit. So I, I put up, uh, you know, out of my little umbrella stand, just plopped, I found a, a bent, um, twig, branch, whatever we want to call it, fit perfectly into my umbrella stand. And I put it up so that if I was standing, I could shoot the birds against the blue background. But if I were actually to sit down, then I would be shooting up and I could use the tree as a background. So it was kind of a dual purpose thing. A lot of the birds would fly into the tree when they come from the woods or wherever they're coming from, um, go to that tree, hop onto the perch and then go jump onto the food and eat there. So it worked out really well. And again, it gave me the opportunity to shoot from with multiple backgrounds from the same spot. And a lot of these I just shoot, now this is shooting out of our kitchen door. So I can eat, you know, just kind of sit on the floor, use the tree for the background, or when I sit up in a chair, I've got the blue background. And these are little dark-eyed juncos, which are very common in this area. This is my most common bird. We probably get 40 or 50 of these throughout our yard during the day. And they're usually very cooperative. A lot of the birds, though, you'll find they just want to eat on the, the seeds that are falling out of the feeders. They want to just eat on the ground. So, you know, if you've got that, sprinkle a little seed in the grass. You know, once the birds are coming into the yard, set it up where you want them, you know, put a little pile of bird seed there. And then the key is to get nice and low. Uh, whenever I do this, I'm usually just sitting right on the ground, shooting, you know, what I call my ground feeders. Um, again, nice and natural, could be in a park, could be anywhere, doesn't take a very large section of grass. Again, you want them coming to a specific spot, so that's where you're sprinkling the seeds. And a lot of times they'll, they'll surprise you. It's amazing what comes out of our backyard. 
Uh, we have robins that come on a nightly basis, and I'm amazed that they're still pulling uh, worms out of our yard uh, over a period of time. But this type of year in particular, uh, birds, yes, they're still eating seed, they're feeding themselves, but they're looking for bugs that they can take back to the nest also. So you will see a lot of different behaviors and a lot of different activity this time of year, which is a lot of fun. But again, just sitting down on the grass, um, you know, I find that the more time I spend in the backyard, the more acclimated they are to me. So, you know, I'll go out and pull weeds in the afternoon and then, you know, come five o'clock, I'll go get my camera when the sun's nice and low and can give me a shot like this. Uh, they're used to seeing me out there. I'm not a threat to them. And they come in nice and close to feed. But again, you can keep this real simple. Find a twig and stick it in the ground. Again, if you've been putting food on the ground, you just put this right over the top of where you've got the food, and this you'll find a real high percentage of the birds that are gonna come eat off the ground will wanna land on that perch first before they look around. Uh, it just makes it nice and simple. And again, just kind of shooting across, this is a plant in the corner in our fence, but it's blurred enough to where it looks nice and natural. Try some different size sticks, something that's going to be appropriate size for the birds that are coming into your yard. A lot of juncos in these pictures, I'm afraid. But again, this is our backyard. This is kind of my evening view. Now, we went from the stump, which started to just rot too much and was making a mess. Went and bought one of these feeders. Uh, Wild Birds Unlimited is a big chain in the U.S. They've got these kits. Um, so we decided to get some of the food off the ground also to kind of discourage the squirrels and some of the other stuff that was coming in the yard to feed. Got everything up off the ground. Uh, but again, to get that natural perch with zip ties, I just took a branch and stuck it on the top. Um, it meant shooting up a little bit in order to get that clear view into the sky. In the morning, I'm shooting from the other side of the yard back in the direction where I was sitting here. This is my afternoon view. So again, it's a kind of a narrow corridor that I can shoot in, but the birds are used to coming to that food. Again, they'll hit that branch. A vast majority of the birds were going to hit that branch above it, look around, and then jump down to the food. So, but just by having that branch on the feeders, just above the feeders, excuse me, um, it lets you get this kind of an image. And, and these are pretty simple. They'll do this time and time again. And when they get up, they tend to look around a little bit again, making sure there's no threats in the yard, see who else is around. They'll jump down and eat. Oftentimes they'll come back up, look around again before they take off. And again, I think one of the real keys is to have the perch above the food rather than same level or a little bit below. Getting into some different setups, you know, it doesn't get much easier than this. Went down to a local uh, park, picked up a dozen rocks or so, brought it up. As you can see, the picture on the left left a little gap um, where I could put the food down on the ground. Some bigger rocks in back, some of the smaller rocks in front. You can kind of see what it looks like on the right. Uh, again, not much of a background, but by shooting this from a nice low angle, it almost looks like it's at a, a natural stream or something. Um, the birds are going to come down, stand on the rocks, reach down, feed. This guy's got a bit of a messy beak, but um, it, again, just shows you it's a real simple setup. Doesn't take a lot of space. Just sitting in my kitchen door, shooting out the back, uh, and it, it just gives it a whole different look. You want to get a little bit fancier. Um, Tried something a little bit different here. We've got a little cart. Decided to put a tray on the cart, put a branch, some rocks, pull up a little moss. In the Seattle area, it's incredibly wet. We get moss growing just about anywhere and everywhere. Um, so again, similar to what was on the ground, this way up on a tray though with some water in front. Um, my initial thought was get a reflection off the water and, and try to get a little bit fancy. Um, the trays that I put down for food, I found <laughs> every time I tried it, the crows would come and steal the tray. So that didn't work too well. But this was the basic setup. 
you know, you can see there's a little branch in the back for them to land on, reach down, eat the food, uh, have the rocks arranged a little bit. You can see, uh, you know, again, the, the, the shot of the bird. I was kind of going for a reflection, wanted to get the birds. I wasn't real happy with it. I think part of it was because I was using a gray tray and it was kind of throwing the colors of the water off a little bit. But that was the original concept, but real easy to do. You know, this is a little tray that we bought to put, you know, boots in when you come in and they're muddy in the winter or they're, you know, all wet. Again, just use those same rocks and a little bit of moss to pile them up there. Also, if you look at the background, this was just the, the fence as it was, and it just didn't look right. You know, it, it just didn't look natural. Um, so, yeah, here, a little bit better example. Just not a real pleasing overall look, I thought. I mean, the birds were incredibly good about landing on that that branch every time, reach down, grab the food. And I would move the rocks around. This one doesn't look too good. The rock's too big in front. But I was trying to hide the um, In fact. I think you can just see yeah, uh, the corner of the little food container that I had down there. Um, yeah, it's, it's a work in progress. Again, as you start to build these things, you see what looks right, what doesn't. Um, but I switched out the background. And this, I thought, gave it a real nice look. A little tighter shot, move the rocks and, and put a little bit more moss in there um, and was pretty happy with the way this looked. So again, look natural. And this is just on a cart right outside our the back door of our kitchen. What I used, um, actually I found this and easy to order online, camouflage netting. Um, and I, I think I put, picked the, the cheapest one. I tried a couple different colors. Uh, the darker green, and then there's a lighter tan one that I've got in, in some of the other areas. Just doubled that up and just, again, I used a stapler and just kind of stapled it to the back of the fence behind there. I know exactly where the birds are going to land for that food. I mean, if they land on the edges, uh, it, not a picture that I wanted because then that goes off of where I had my background set up. Wait for them to come into the food. I've got my background lined up perfectly for where I wanted it, and it just makes it really simple. Um, some other things that people use, I know, for backgrounds, uh, sheets of AstroTurf. You know, you can get AstroTurf, the fake grass. Um, you can use different types of fabrics, uh, spray, spray painted muslins, that type of thing. Um, and then there's other people who will go out to fields and just take an out of focus picture of the field, print that up, mount it on foam core or metal, and use that as their background. So there's just all sorts of different things that you can do. It's going to be something that's going to go out of focus and again just give it a much more natural look than it would otherwise um, as they get acclimated to you being there and coming into these positions it's amazing how close you can get now this was actually the the new 150 to 400 millimeter lens with the 1.25 x activated and the 2x so this was as much telephoto as i can get uh, and just when they would come into that perch i was able to get these uh, i thought you know, just really fun headshots of the birds. We're very fortunate in that we get a couple type of hummingbirds too to come around. Now year round, we keep three or four hummingbird feeders up. In the winter, we keep them heated so that they are um, they don't freeze up when it gets cold. And I've got this, this one plant in the corner and I'll probably mispronounce it, the Crocros, no, Crocrosmia, something plant uh, but it blooms for a very short time but when it's in bloom the hummingbirds go crazy for it this is all available light i've got again about an hour and a half maybe two hour window in the evenings where the light is just perfect the idea in a situation like this is you know those hummingbirds are going to come around when a hummingbird has a flower that it likes or a feeder that it likes every 10 to 20 minutes it's going to come by so what I tend to do is I'll set up maybe, you know, 15, 20 feet away. It's going to come, make its first pass, move up a little bit closer. It comes, and, and again, as it's used to seeing you there and you're not a threat, you can get closer and closer. So in the end, you've got your picture framed exactly the way you want it. In this case, I use a tripod pre-focus on the flower. Now, all the Olympus cameras have touch screens on the back. When the bird flies in, just to make sure that it's perfectly focused on its head, just tap the screen to get it to just kind of refocus, confirm focus on the head, 
and you can there's three different settings you can turn the touch screen off you can have it just focus or you can have it focus and then shoot as soon as it's in focus so just by tapping on the head of the bird to make sure the head's going to be in focus most important part it's going to lock focus and shoot as soon as i tap it every single time and it just makes it real simple the, the key to hummingbirds if you're fortunate enough to get them to coming through your yard Kind of, again, learn their schedules. Every 10 to 20 minutes, they're going to come around if the food is out. And if they're real happy, they'll stay. Uh, they're very protective of their territory. So if they're happy with your backyard, they're going to be camped out very close by where they can either watch your backyard or they're going to physically be there. And as other birds come near, they're going to try to chase them off. Uh, and that gets a little crazy. We've got about 10 birds that come through on a regular basis and the chases are just all day long. Uh, again, every once in a while when there's no flowering plants in our backyard, because we are very good at killing plants, I must admit, unfortunately, um, we'll just go get some potted plants, set them up on a little table. Uh, this is just uh, a deeply shadowed background and just wait and they'll come around like clockwork. To try to get a little bit fancier, again, shooting out the back door, um, tried to do some hummingbirds with a flash. I, I was a little hesitant at first because I wasn't sure how the flash was going to affect the birds. So I was I was real careful, wanted to watch their reaction and uh, didn't seem to phase them in the least. So in a situation like this, now there's multiple ways to do this and there's all sorts of YouTube videos and all about multiple flash setups with a hummingbird. But we've got one feeder that I put, it's about uh, 12 feet from our back door. I've got a little flash mounted on a light stand. Actually, not a little flash. This is actually a big studio strobe um, mounted on a light stand just a couple feet away from the feeder. I actually used a, a, a wired flash in this case. Again, pre-focus on the feeder, wait for the hummingbird to fly up. What they tend to do is they'll feed back off, look to see if there's any other birds or competition around, and go back and feed and, and kind of back out and go back and forth a few times. And when they pull away, that's your opportunity to take the picture. And you can see in the background, again, I've got the lighter colored little camouflage netting um, stapled to the fence. Instead of just being that flat color, it gives you a little bit of texture, a little bit of depth to the background when you use something like that. just gives it a much more natural look. But this is the type of feeder that you want to use when you're trying to shoot hummingbirds. No place for them to land because when they can land, they tend to just fly in, land, and fly out. And they're so fast, it's almost impossible to try to get a shot. So no place for them to land, just with a single opening. Uh, again, it just gives you those opportunities. So here's just a quick video of what happens when you use this type of feeder. You'll see, <coughs> excuse me, how they back out, look around, make sure there's no competition. Now the key is then to catch them looking in your direction, uh, but just gives you an idea. You get a couple opportunities generally every time they come up to the feeder that way. And again, this is just shooting out the kitchen door, just try to line everything up properly in advance so they're coming where you want them to come. Uh, what makes the most sense, whoops, sorry to get your images. So again, on the left-hand side, uh, this is the male and a hummingbird where they he just backed away. Then I figured I'd try something different also. Um, it's a much easier shot when you get them while they're feeding, but in order to hide the feeder, just clipped, uh, there were some trees in bloom down the street, went and clipped off a little branch uh, and tied it to the feeder to where, again, it gave a little more natural look like the, the hummingbird was feeding off the flowers rather than from the feeder itself. For woodpeckers, it gets a little bit different. Now, this isn't my backyard. Uh, I wish it was. If you get some woodpeckers in your area or you're trying to draw them into your yard, just get yourself about a three or four foot section of wood, drill some holes, into the side of it and then you can plug it with what's called suet uh, they actually make plugs that you can just plug in or you can get what they call i think it's bark butter that you can smear into the openings 
So you just do that on one side or maybe two opposite sides, but where you can go to look, it looks completely natural when you shoot it from the side. Woodpeckers come in, feed directly off of the, you know, on the suet that's stuffed inside there. And again, to give you that perfectly natural look. Uh, and I do want to thank Jeff Sweet, a uh, good friend who has this set up in his backyard. He has what I would call the extreme backyard set up. I'll show you a few more pictures from that. Uh, but this is a real simple idea. Again, it just attach that, that, um, stick, for lack of a better term, branch uh, onto a stand of some sort, sort, so it lines up with the background that you're looking for, and it gives you a great natural looking appearance. Uh, this is kind of, again, from Jeff's backyard. Uh, he's got a nice piece of property, beautiful views, surrounded by trees. So he's got an extensive collection um, of different types of feeders. The goal is to track just about anything and everything. And these are actually two different setups as he has in his yard. He lives in bear country. So this is actually set up so that he can raise it up out of reach at night. Uh, so the bears can't get at it. But the goal here is to try to catch birds as they're coming in. You know, again, they're coming out of the trees that surround all these feeders. Um, so try to catch them as they're coming in and out. Uh, a little bit more challenging than getting him to hit on a perch, but he does have a bunch of perches around some of these as well, which makes it nice and easy. You know, they'll come, look, check out, make sure the coast is clear, uh, and then come in and feed. So when you see the birds lining up at these different perches, uh, it's a great opportunity to shoot as well. So working with available light, you know, in our yards, it's not always perfect. In my backyard, in the mornings, I have to shoot from left to right in the afternoons, right to left. And you know, on overcast days, which we get an awful lot of in Seattle, it doesn't really matter as much. You know, that's when I do a lot of shooting out uh, the kitchen door. Makes it a little bit easier. Um, but also, when you watch how the sun affects your backyard, you can also find those deep pockets of shade. If you can get a bird in bright sunshine, and what's behind it is one of those deep pockets of shade, you don't really have to worry so much. It's just going to go black. You know, we have um, our band-tailed pigeons that come around in the morning sometimes. Uh, they like to sit out in the sun and eat. But at that time of day, the fences, everything behind them is in, still in very deep shade. So it makes for a much more dramatic picture. Same thing, you know, again, as the sun starts to creep around in the afternoon, starts throwing the backgrounds in the shade, try to move the plants out a little bit, keep them in the sun. Uh, and again, just the, the shot on the right is just a stick stuck in the grass, but I was sitting to where the background was going to be in the shade. Uh, again, we get open shade or an overcast day. You got to be a little bit pickier about what you're seeing as a background. Um, now that we're using the platform feeder as the birds are sitting up on that, try to line it up with that tree in the next door neighbor's yard works out pretty well. Or again, if they just land on the fence, you get a, a nice big bird. Um, again, shoot wide open, try to soften that background up a little bit, uh, makes for a nice image. And again, hummingbirds, if they like your feeders, they're going to be close by. They want to know what's going on in your yard at all times. They want to protect their food source. When you are working with direct sun, again, you want to try to keep the sun at your back as much as possible. Um, it's real nice when you can get that catch light in the bird's eye. It just helps make it look a little more alive, add a little more depth to your image. Uh, and as you can see here, my grass is a little unkempt. Again, shooting birds is a great excuse for getting out of yard work because, boy, doesn't it look a lot more natural when the grass isn't cut? It works for me once in a while, not always. Um, when you don't want to shoot right to left or left to right necessarily, depending on where the sun is, um, using a flash is an option also. Now, these are two shots done in succession where the, my batteries are starting to run down a little bit, so it didn't fire the second time. Um, 
I was, again, real hesitant when I started using Flash, watched real carefully to see the reaction that I was getting from the birds. And the only one that it seemed to bother were crows for some reason. They were very sensitive. So after one or two shots of a flash at the crows, um, I stopped doing that. The little robins, juncos, finches never seemed to have any effect whatsoever. Um, but it gives you opportunities to shoot in different directions throughout the day. You know, um, when I shoot in the mornings, when I'm shooting in my yard from left to right, I've got a, a little nicer background generally. But if I want to shoot from that same angle in the afternoons, then I need to use a flash to fill in. And if I do, I can get this type of shot where I've kind of got that rim lighting on the bird and using the flash to fill. Um, these were done with the EM1X and the FL900R just mounted. Um, I set the shutter and aperture manually and just use the flash uh, as a TTL fill flash. So uh, reasonably simple setup. Uh, this just kind of gives you an idea of what the flash does to a, a bird's eye. You know, with humans, we get red eye. If you shoot your dog, a lot of times you'll get green eye reflection. But with the bird, it just kind of gives a, a, a hot spot, you know, for lack of a better term. It doesn't really have that, you know, red eye, green eye effect at all. Uh, and it actually, I think, is it helpful in a lot of situations. Again, this was kind of shooting into the sun, a little more of an overcast day. Uh, but it just gives you a few more angles that you can shoot from possibly throughout the day. Watch your angles. Um, now, when I go out, I try to say, all right, I want to shoot birds on this perch roughly in this position, so I want to get everything set. You know, here was a case where the bird landed a little bit lower on the perch. Our next door neighbor's house has got a big section where it's just kind of this flat gray color. So I figured, all right, I'm gonna shoot birds in this spot. Well, when this particular bird landed a little bit lower, I started shooting and then realized that, oops, the windows and I think it's the garage door were cutting into the frame a little bit. So again, be very mindful of what's behind your bird just shifted over to my left, I think it was a little bit to move the bird farther away from the window. And then with a the little crop, made for a real nice picture. That is, you know, a house in the background there. But fortunately, there's a flat enough section on the wall where it just made for a real nice background. So, you know, those are some ideas for settings, some of the different things maybe you want to look for. Um, I know Michelle had asked me to, to talk about some of the different camera settings a little bit and what I do and what I use. And, and quite frankly, I've gotten really spoiled. Um, ever since the, the bird tracking uh, firmware upgrade came on the E1X, it's really spoiled me. For this type of photography in particular, it is incredibly effective. You know, again, when you've got the full view of the birds, um, the this automatic, focus detect on the birds is incredible. It works great. But just a quick kind of rundown of the, some of the different settings that I use. Um, I have always shoot at either aperture priority or full manual. If the lighting is real consistent on my subject, uh, but the background may be changing, again, if I'm working with those real deep shadows, then I'll probably just go to full manual. If I know my bird, I'm just going to be shooting them while they're sitting out in the sun, but that dark background could throw off my exposure. I'm going to want to go manual. If conditions are changing a little bit, I'll go aperture priority. Always manually set my ISO. And that's, you know, I set my aperture generally wide open or maybe stop down one stop, set my ISO to make sure I'm going to get a fast enough shutter speed to get the kind of image that I want. Uh, but based on the lighting conditions. So even on a sunny day, I'll set it to 400, or if I'm trying to catch birds in flight or launching off of a perch, I may even go to 800 on a sunny day. Uh, generally continuous low mechanical shutter, that generally gives me a fast enough shutter speed, or excuse me, fast enough advance, I'm able to get the sequences I want. AF sensitivity, this is one that confuses everybody. It goes from minus two to plus two. Uh, plus one seems to be the most effective as an overall setting from what I've found in experimenting. Uh, but that one's uh, is real subjective. Natural color palette, uh, one of the real strengths of the Olympus system is, is the colors. 
and just the natural color palette for me has always uh, been the best way to go. It's also really amazing how accurate the white balance is on these cameras. If you've got some unusual lighting situations and you've got a nice sunny day, then nothing wrong with putting it on sunny or, or, or cloudy or whatever it might be. Uh, I tend to just leave it on auto and it does incredibly well. ESP metering, that's the evaluative metering where it's going to look at the entire area um, and, and, you know, try to adjust the settings. One thing, and I think it's in another slide or two, is exposure compensation is your best friend. Uh, and we'll kind of go over that a little bit also. But on my custom settings, Pro Capture High and Pro Capture Low are my go-to, you know, just can't live without them settings. Uh, and I'll touch on when to use those in, in a couple slides also. Um, when you're using the, the CAF plus tracking when birds, you want all your focus points active and you want to turn off your face and eye detection. So um, makes it really simple. Um, EM1 XY, I, ju I just, I love it. Now I shot for years and I still have my EM1 Mark II. So you do things a little bit differently with that camera. But as far as aperture priority or full manual, still the same there. Still manually set the ISO. Instead of CAF plus tracking, I had a lot more luck just in using CAF. Um, so no tracking set up. I found that that didn't work quite as well um, as just trying to keep my focus points on my subject in CAF. Still continuous low mechanical shutter. <coughs> Excuse me one second. Um, plus one on the AF sensitivity. Now there's options that came with uh, firmware upgrade. Gosh, I guess it's been about a year or so where there's a center AF start and center AF priority settings. And again, I'll touch on those in just a minute, but I found that the cameras tend to lock focus faster when you use center AF start. And again, a little more detail on that coming natural color palette, auto white balance, again, some of the same things here. Instead of having all the focus points active though, uh, kind of my go-to, at least to start with, is the three by three focus points. And you want to try to keep that over the top of the head of your subject all the time, um, which can be a little challenging at time, but we'll go into that a little bit also. Exposure compensation, all the Olympus cameras have it. In fact, I think probably every camera made has it at this point. You can use it in program, when you're in shutter priority, aperture priority, and when you're in manual using auto ISO. Exposure compensation gives you the ability to lighten and darken the image from what the camera is recommending the exposure should be. The goal is always to get your exposure perfect in camera so you don't have to spend time making adjustments in post-processing to lighten and darken your image. So learn to trust your viewfinder. You know, what you see in your viewfinder is the picture that you're going to get. If it looks a little too light or a little too dark, um, your best bet, use that exposure compensation dial to make sure your exposure is right on the money before you take the picture. That's probably the single, in my mind, biggest advantage of a mirrorless camera over a traditional DSLR is that you're able to see the exposure and again, make sure your exposure is perfect before you even take the picture. Um, super important. Custom modes, again, I had said I use uh, Pro Capture High and Pro Capture Low. If you're going to assign custom modes to your camera, what you do is you put all the settings the way you want it, the way you want to assign them. So um, if I say I want Pro Capture High and I want 800 ISO and um, you know I want my lens wide open and I want natural color balance, I set my camera up that way. I pull up my menu and on the EM1X in shooting menu number one, where you can either reset or you can assign the custom modes, toggle to the right. It'll ask you what you want to do. So you want to assign those settings to a custom mode toggle to the right again, and then it gives you those options. Do you want to put it on, on again, on this camera, it has um, C1, C2, C3 on the dial, so I can assign those to C1, C2, C3. And then as soon as I go back out of this, as soon as I turn my dial to those settings, it'll be locked in to all those presets. 
So when I see that bird perched, that's about to fly off and I want to use Pro Capture, uh, I just turn the dial real quick and I've got all my settings locked in already and I'm ready to go. For the center start and center priority, now this is if you're using anything other than the single spot focus point. CAF center start, let's say you're using the three by three square. It's going to look to that center square first. If it can't lock focus right away, it's going to look at the surrounding eight points. And I have found that that's where I tended to get my best results, my fastest focus lock uh, when I was using the cameras. CAF center priority seemed to spend more time just looking at the center point. And if it couldn't lock focus, it was a little slower to lock overall. Um, so again, my suggestion would be for this type of photography, CAF center start, uh, great way to go. Um, focus points, again, the key is to keep your focus point on your subject's head. With the AM1X bird tracking, it does it for you. If you keep your, again, three by three or the five point cross or whatever focus pattern you're using, um, the EM1X and the EM1 Mark III have a joystick where you can move those groups around by toggling that joystick up, down, right, left, whatever it might be. If your bird's looking right, you bring it over to its eye, it turns and looks left, you can swing it around. Uh, and again, the, the goal is to keep your focus points on the eye. If you don't have either of those cameras, all the EM1 series cameras, I believe all the EM5 series cameras, maybe not the first one, um, have what's called an AF targeting pad mode. If you turn that on, while you're looking through the viewfinder, you can, with your thumb, move the focus points just on the LCD screen by dragging your thumb around on the screen. And it just makes it so much easier to try to keep your focus exactly where you want it. Again, drag that focus point to where it stays on the head of the bird, uh, and it's going to make sure you've got your focus locked where you want it. I'm picking up the pace because I know we're running short on time. There's a couple other <laughs> topics, so I apologize. We're going to go up fast here. Again, some of the different options you have on focus points. Um, the single point is really, in my mind, and if you can keep your single point exactly where you want it on your subject all the time, you're a better photographer than me. I found that the 3x3 three three or the, the five-point cross um, tended to be a little bit easier and again, to move those down either with the joystick on one of the newer cameras or by using the AF targeting pad uh, will make it a lot easier. You can on a couple of the, the cameras, and um, Michelle is going to have to help out of this one because I don't recall exactly which cameras do this. I believe um, there's a couple of the newer cameras. You can actually do custom AF points also. I have my EM1 Mark II set up so that when I turn it vertically, it'll automatically go to a three point custom focus point because when I go vertically, it's almost always, I'm close enough, I wanna do a portrait type shot of a bird. And I want those focus points to fall right on its head. So when I'm going vertically, it's automatically gonna to default to that position. So that's um, kind of a nice little cheat that gets your focus points where you want them as quickly as possible. One of the biggest reasons for Olympus and just it's almost like cheating is pro capture. If you haven't experimented with pro capture with birds, you're really missing out. In pro capture, as you press the shutter button down halfway on the camera, it's going to start putting images into your buffer. If you take your finger off the shutter button and never fully depress, those pictures all go away. You never actually took a picture. But if you have your finger down halfway, and you decide that was the moment that I wanted to capture, and then you press down all the way, you've already, in essence, pre-captured. You have up to 35 images in your camera buffer that will then be recorded onto your memory card. So you can react rather than try to predict when the image is going, or the action is going to happen, and already have captured it. So again, bird, about to take off from a perch rather than trying to predict. And every time it flinches, you're taking a series of pictures. You keep your shutter button half pressed. You wait till it takes off. 
and then you press your shutter button and then you've got that entire sequence. In Pro Capture High, you're actually taking up to 60 frames per second, but it will lock focus on the first image. So it's not going to continue to focus um, on your subject as it moves. In Pro Capture Low, you're shooting up to 18 frames per second, but it will adjust focus between frames. So for me, if a bird is going to the side, I want to go to Pro Capture High because my real goal is to try to get that big wing spread that you see um, on the image on the right hand side here. That's the shot you want, whether the wings are up or down at 60 frames per second. If it's going to the side, I know my focus really isn't going to change much and I've got a much better opportunity to get that exact moment that I want. If the bird's going to be coming towards me or flying off at an angle, by going to Pro Capture Low, it's going to continue to adjust focus between frames and again, give me that better chance of getting the shot that I'm looking for. So again, bird launching off of a perch, get that full wing spread. The shot on the right, I was waiting for the little goldfinch to take off and then I saw the other bird coming through the background and it didn't occur to me until it already passed and then I just you know, kind of reflexively pressed the shutter button, but I'd already captured that entire sequence. Um, so that I thought was kind of a fun one. Um, in Pro Capture, uh, again, Pro Capture High and Low, if you're adjusting your Pro Capture High settings in the menus, for the High Speed Advance, there's a group of settings. Now you can do it, adjust your settings for just shooting high speed mechanical shutter, high speed electronic, or again, under the Pro Capture settings. And it's up to 60 frames per second. If that's way too many, you can back that off a little bit. You can also adjust how many frames you capture before uh, pressing down the shutter button all the way. And it's up to 35. I tend to keep it around 14 shots or so. That tends to be enough. I will warn you, you will take a lot of pictures when you're using Pro Capture mode. Uh, it adds up very, very quickly. But I'm pre-capturing, uh, again, so four, 14 pictures or up to 35. And then you can limit the number of pictures you take. Um, and I think uh, 25 is the default, if I'm not mistaken, um, when the camera comes out of the box. But I would turn that off because you want to make sure you never want to lose an image because the camera is going to stop. You know, chances are you're not going to be shooting an extended sequence, but leave it off just in case. Uh, and this way, you know, again, you're pre-capturing, you're able to follow the sequence, uh, and it just opens up all sorts of new possibilities. In Pro Capture Eye, that's one time again where I'll tend to use a tripod. So when I'm looking up at that perch, it's a little hard to see in here, um, but I'm just waiting for the birds to fly in and out. When you've got a perch, again, as I was saying, they tend to land on the high side of the perch. So I'm just kind of pre-framed and waiting for things to come in and out of that spot. Uh, if you are shooting, you know, this time of year, as Michelle said earlier, you're getting a lot of babies coming into the yard that are going to be begging for food from mom and dad. Uh, here's a house finch, little baby begging for food from dad. We've had, I think, four different species of babies so far this year. Last year, I think we actually had seven, which was a lot of fun. Uh, but if you are going to have fences or something in there, it's it, real important. Keep your horizon lines level. To help you with that, you also have grid settings that you can put on your LCD screen and see in the viewfinder. Um, and that's something that just can be, it, it's a nice tip, whether you're shooting scenic pictures, uh, whatever it might be. I tend to use the one that gives me the rule of thirds. Uh, it just makes it that much easier to help compose your image and keep your horizons line level while you're looking through the viewfinder. Uh, there's a couple different options. There's some crosshairs and some other things as well. But the, uh, the rule of thirds screen on there, I think is really, really helpful. Uh, don't forget, bad weather too can be a lot of fun to shoot in. It can get a little cold. Um, I tell you, we, have, we get one or two snows a year, but when we do, uh, I tend to just clear out a small patch, put the food down, and wow, do we get big crowds of birds uh, in snowy weather. And it, it can make for some fun images. Uh, when I had shoveled off some of the snow as it was piled up, the birds were actually coming just kind of sitting on the piles of snow waiting for me to put food down. I think they get a little bit spoiled. Uh, if you get small birds to the yard, look for some small branches to use as perch. 
you know, again, here I had one that was a little big, so didn't work too well. Um, some of the nicer poses, you know, when you can get the tail through the head in the shot, it's always great whether they're looking forward or kind of turning from the back. Um, those are some of the nicer poses that you can look for. When they're looking at you straight on, it's still a nice picture, but it's not sure nice to be able to see those tails when you can. Uh, and the bird, if you're shooting it in profile, you want the head to be angled towards you or at least looking straight to the side. If they're kind of looking away, it's just not as impactful unless you can see what they're looking at. So again, just a quick tip. That's a bit of a clunker. Um, if you are looking at accessories, uh, a couple of different things you might want to look at. If you're using a tripod, what's called a gimbal head, just makes it so much easier to follow moving subjects. Uh, I would highly recommend check your local camera stores if you've still got one, hopefully. Um, also, the longer the lens you use, sometimes the harder it is to find your subject. Uh, Olympus makes a little gadget called the EE-1, which mounts right on the hot shoe. You can actually use this with any brand camera. It's weatherproof, it, um, has its own little battery inside. I think the battery I've had in mine has been good for like four years or so and still going strong. But it shows you a wider angle view of the scene, but it shows you dead on where the camera is looking. So it just makes it that much easier to line it up with your perch or whatever it might be, and then you can confirm on the LCD screen and back. Um, one other thing, and this is last slide, I promise. Um, if you have a backyard and you've got some real skittish birds, you know, maybe you want to put up a blind. Now, I've actually got one similar to the one on the right. I used it one day in the backyard and I just felt like such an idiot sitting out there with his blind off. Um, and it, and I, I didn't think it's necessary for the birds in my backyard. They're so used to me. But, you know, again, depending on the space that you have, there may only be one spot where you can sit. If you put one of these little pop-up tents out there and leave it out there, you can go in and out and, and the birds then don't see you and they may be much more likely to come around. So just something to be aware of, something you might want to consider. Um, at least the type that I tried and used, I, I didn't find it to be helpful at all, but I could definitely see where the, the more tent structures, the more permanent structure that you would leave set up uh, could be a big help. Hopefully you picked up a couple pointers here and there. Um, you know, just get out there and try, move some things around, try some different settings. Uh, I hope it all works out for you. I mean, I, I really hope people can take great pictures. I know I'm always inspired online um, with all the different bird photography that I see always makes me want to do better and better. Uh, if you do have questions that I can help with, uh, steveballbirds at gmail.com on Instagram. I tend to post ah, three or four different bird shots a week. Uh, old underscore Steve one. And again, just want to thank everybody for coming. Went a little bit over. Hopefully, Michelle, we can still do some question and answer. Uh, let me, if I need to stop sharing so you can come on. Can you see Oop. me? I'm getting there. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> awesome. All that, right. was, that was so helpful. I, I, I'm out I, of breath. <laughs> I wish that I would have had some of these tips last night when I was out shooting all my finches. All my baby finches are coming up to my bird feeder, but I don't have a nice stick for them to go, so they just sit on my bird feeder. So that's what I've got right now. It's a bunch of bird right. feeder shots. It's hard. I mean, I believe me, I have tons of pictures of birds on bird feeder because you're always excited when you see them. You want to get that shot just to capture it as much as anything else. Our woodpeckers, I need to do a setup similar to the one uh, my friend Jeff has. They just fly straight to the feeder and then they're gone. They don't tend to hang around much. So yeah, I know I need to still tweak some things and add some things, but uh, any questions we can try to answer? I mean, uh, hopefully something. Yeah, there were a couple of questions. Um, one happened quite a while ago um, and it was mostly on whether or not you shot with a tripod or not, which I know how your setup is and I know you did share that, but I hoped maybe you could touch on some of the times that you choose to shoot with a tripod and sometimes that you don't. Yeah, uh, for the longest time I never did, except for hummingbirds, because hummingbirds I found you can get exceptionally close. Again, you don't want to move much. You don't want to be threatening. 
I would go set up, and again, every couple minutes or every pass, I would move closer and closer, and my goal was to just sit as quietly as I could behind the camera, not move, have my camera preset on the flower that I was waiting for them to come to, and again, just tap the back of the camera to take the picture, so I wasn't having to move at all. I wasn't raising and lowering the camera every time they came. I would just set up on a tripod. Works great. And so for the longest time, I mean, that was the only time I would use a tripod. And maybe now that I'm getting older, I tend to use a little bit more in the backyard. When I go out to shoot, never take a tripod with me. You know, when I go to the local parks, wildlife refuge, whatever it might be. But now again, when I'm, I'm go out with the plan of trying to shoot birds that are coming in and landing and I'm shooting in pro capture mode, I will use a tripod. And again, shooting out uh, the back kitchen door when I'm trying to get those hummingbirds coming in and out of the, the feeder, catching them in flight. Uh, again, I want everything lined up in advance, so I will use a tripod there also. Uh, but a lot of times when I'm going out, particularly the one I'm shooting birds just on the ground, it's all handheld. Somebody just asked where you bought your blind from. Uh, it was off of Amazon. I almost hate to admit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. Somebody else in the comments also answered the same thing. And thank you, comment section. I love when you guys answer the comments for us because it makes it so much easier while I'm trying to watch all these comments come through. You guys are great. You guys are all the real MVPs here. <laughs> well, uh, I'll tell you one thing about the the birding community, bird photography community, and I've been doing this, I guess, five or six years now. Most helpful, friendly group of people you'll ever want to meet. I mean, it's just a lot of good people out there. Somebody says they're looking forward to seeing you in New Mexico this year. Are you going? Are you going to be there? You tell me. <laughs> <laughs> I hope we'll be there. That would be great. Yeah, I hope <laughs> I so. I want to go. Uh, yeah, I, I really hope to. I mean, I missed last year. I've been the prior four years, I think it was. Um, for those of you out there that are into birds, Bosque del Apache is just one of those magical places. Um, during the winter, November, December, uh, the sandhill cranes and the geese, uh, tens of thousands. It is just a magical experience when they all lift off in the morning and as they're coming in in the evening. Uh, it's just one of those things that, Again, if you're into this, you got to see it at some point. All right. Oh, it, it, the comments are moving really quick for me to keep up tonight, guys. Sorry. <laughs> uh, what ISO range do you use? Where's your comfort zone there? Um, I, again, sunny days, I'll be 400 or 800. Again, if I'm trying to capture some of the faster action, 800. Living in Seattle in the winter, it's overcast, it's cloudy, it's dreary all the time. 1600 regularly, um, 3200 if need be, but um, 1600 I'm totally comfortable with any time, any situation. Um, and as total sacrilege, uh, I tend to shoot JPEG. Uh, mm -hmm. And you know, everything that you saw in here is from the camera, Wi Fi to a tablet, crop, maybe a little color saturation, emailed to my laptop where I put it into these presentations. Um, I, I don't believe in overthinking a lot of this stuff. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. I apologize. That's okay. I've kept you on overnight. <laughs> yeah. Um, but easily up to 1600, I, I never had to worry about noise or any issues. And again, the key, get your exposure right in the camera. If you underexpose and then try to recover uh, the image, that's where noise tends to be a real problem. But if you get your exposures right, it's it's rarely an issue. Uh, so Karen just asked what your go-to lens is. Um, I know which one it is now, but could you talk about some of your favorites through the years? Because I know it's changed a little bit. It has changed a little bit. Mm -hmm. I am very fortunate in that I was one of the first to get the 150 to 400. I can't imagine ever taking it off my camera. I am spoiled beyond belief. Um, I tend to use the 150 to 400 now with the 1.2 converter in all the time. Again, the more reach, the merrier. But for three plus years, I shot the 300 millimeter. And again, I always had the 1.4 um, teleconverter on. 
And um, that was great. I mean, occasionally I would miss an opportunity because I couldn't back up enough. Um, you know, one of my favorites was down in Arizona where uh, a hawk was literally chasing a roadrunner down a, a path and then around these bushes running around, and I couldn't back up on the path I was on so I could only catch one at a time. So those happened. But an incredible combination. The 300 and the 1.4 converter is a fantastic combination. I actually got the 100 to 400 also shortly before the 150 to 400 came out. That's an awesome lens too. If I was going on a safari where I was, you know, in the back of a Jeep or something, that's probably the lens that I would take. Again, smaller, lighter. It needs a little better light. You know, you're not going to be able to shoot quite as early in the morning and maybe quite as late in the evening. The 100 to 400 is an amazingly sharp lens and it's still nice and compact. So it's hard to go wrong with any one of those. In a perfect world, we would probably all have 150 to 400s and a porter to help us carry it. Uh, <laughs> now, I've gone out and shot with it for six hours straight, and it's not a real issue. I mean, it does tend to get heavier after a while. It, it is definitely the biggest and heaviest of the bunch, um, but it, it it's really a special lens. Any one of those three, though, is awesome. I actually have a 75 to 300 also that I had before the 300 came out. I think I've got the first generation. Still a great little lens. You know, if you've got an EM10 or even an EM5 where the smaller, lighter lens is going to give you a little better balance, um, that works great too. It just, they take a little bit more light because of the slower aperture at the telephoto lens. So again, on those overcast days or shooting real early in the morning, that's where you tend to get to those 3200 and higher ISOs because of the slower aperture. Yeah, I find with the 100 to 400, I like to shoot in the early evening as the sun's just starting to go down because there's yeah. still plenty of light yeah. to make that lens really pop and shine. I like that. That is a, it's a very sharp lens. Yeah, I've been really happy. I was actually using it for macro too the other day. I was photographing the bees. I like that yeah. lens. That's a good one. I all think right. my favorite picture of all time, I've actually, the, for a while, when I first got the 100 400, I was just using that. And I think my favorite of all time of all my bird pictures was done with that at this point. So I don't know what that proves, but anyway. <laughs> <laughs> One more quick question. And then everything else in here is nonstop. Thank you, Steve. This was super informative. And we appreciate that you guys have all taken the time to comment that and be so positive because I learned a lot. And I really hope that you guys also learned a lot tonight. Um, so last question I think that we have tonight is what about the 40 to 150 pro with the two X teleconverter? I actually do use that setup in my backyard because my bird feeder is so close to my table space where I, I sit and the birds like me sitting there. So I get good shots with that, but have you ever used that combo? I have. Um, but I found, you know, for a lot of the stuff that I like to do, the longer reach of the 300 with the one four was my favorite. The 40 to 150, for it's an exceptionally good lens. For whatever reason, though, I just want the most reach that I can possibly get. But again, when I'm going out, I'm really just looking for birds. If you're on safari, if you're, you know, trying to shoot mammals and, you know, what I, what I actually, I think I did a, a write-up for um, the Olympus uh, Learning Center where I was shooting elk. And with the elk, I was shooting more with the 40 to 150 and the doubler. So depending on what you shoot. For birds, I do like a little more reach when possible. But that 40 to 150, if you do people photography, if you're doing portraits, that type of thing, it is just a, it's a dynamite lens. I mean, no question about it. And I, I got to admit, I do have one of those too. So <laughs> <laughs> it comes with me from time to time. <laughs> yeah, it's always nice. When you have a I like selection, the long glass. Yeah, I like the long glass. So anyway, um, but very good. Um, I again want to thank everybody for joining in, and Michelle, always thanks to you for helping host these things and putting it on and uh, asking me to to present. <laughs> well, I'm glad that we had you on finally, and it's really nice to be able to work with you again. I know that without having any of our birding shows this year, it's been really hard to get out and see everyone. So I'm glad that we were able to connect with all of you guys out there tonight and talk about birding. And uh, 
If you join us again in two weeks, we are going to be switching gears again because I'm all about switching gears this week, apparently. Um, we are going to be talking with Brooke Bartleson, and she is going to be going over the basics and intro into breaking into wildlife photography. So if you've not ever really done it, but you're a little curious about it and you want to know what kind of gear you might need or where to find wildlife in a safe way um, and a ethical way, of course, uh, you should definitely join us. It'll be two weeks from now because every other Thursday you can find us here at home with Olympus. Uh, thank you, Steve, so much for being with us tonight. And uh, everyone else, have a great night and uh, make sure you join us in two weeks. Thank you guys Thanks, so, everybody. so much.